Do you think that the police here in New York have ever been more hated? During my career, no. This is the worst I've ever seen. Violent crime is surging in New York City. A random man on a bike like punched me in the face and I was like bleeding everywhere. Let me go back home. <laughs> I don't want to be here. I'm here to find out why. Derek Chauvin has done more to destroy policing in this country than I think in any single event in my life. I'll be speaking with the NYPD. Do you feel people respect the police here in the Bronx? Today's day and age, absolutely not. And those who want to defund them. You actually want to abolish the police? Yeah. Defund the police? No, I agree with that. I'll also be asking whether the Republicans have a shot at winning the governorship for the first time in nearly 20 years. It could possibly see a Republican governor, which would be the biggest election in the country this year. My name is Stephen Edgington, and I'm a reporter from the Daily Telegraph. In this final episode of three films exploring the US midterm elections, I'm here in New York, investigating how progressive politicians have fueled the violent crime wave. In summary, it was a nightmare. Dante's Inferno might be a better description. My first stop was in one of New York City's most violent neighborhoods, the Bronx. There, I met up with Deputy Chief Eric Hernandez. I started our discussion by asking how much change Eric had seen in crime levels in recent years. A dramatic change. More people were moving into New York City and we had significant crime reductions and then unfortunately we have gone backwards significant, not to the levels of the late 80s, early 90s, but uh, an alarming trend of violence throughout our city that has really, really been highlighted throughout the country. How much can you blame the increase in violent crime on the rise of the BLM riots, for example, and other activist movements who are anti-police and anti-cop? I don't know what level I would say that I would blame it on that particular thing. There is no secret that there is a significant anti-police element that has become that much more visible. I wouldn't point at any one particular thing such as BLM or anything, but when you see what has happened during the, the riots of 2020, it is alarming. Do you think that the police here in New York have ever been more hated by some of the public? During my career, no. This is the worst I've ever seen. In 30 years, I've never seen this kind of dynamic. And the belief, there is a belief by some people that the police are actively killing people of color. The reality is that when you look at the total number of police shootings in general, regardless of who the, uh, the, the suspect is or what uh, racial dynamic they are, it is such a very, very tiny component of the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of police encounters that we experience with citizens throughout the year. So the narrative that was created was that the police were killing literally thousands of people. That's factually not true. Eric had set me up with a ride along from one of his officers known as Chuck. Chuck has worked in the NYPD for 17 years and has seen his fair share of violent crime. Do you think this area here at the Bronx, now it's getting a bit dark, mm -hmm. Is it safe to walk around here? Uh, I would not bring my family here. We have a lot of homeless. There's a lot of mentally unstable people who I feel really could benefit from some sort of institutionalization. You can see up and down the streets their, their behavior, uh, pacing back and forth. You know, sometimes they're just yelling at themselves or it's sometimes obvious that they are intoxicated or under the influence of something. I feel New York was safer. The areas that I've worked in were safer earlier in my career than they are today. Yeah, so you see there's this crime scene tape around this uh, vehicle here. Yeah. So uh, my, my, the best guess would be that um, some sort of crime happened here, possibly a shooting, and these officers are securing the crime scene, either waiting for uh, evidence collection or the crime scene unit to come process. Can you tell us about the shooting that happened? Which shooting? The one that got you, sit, uh, you uh, the desk job a few years ago. Oh, okay. um, sorry. That's all right. So <clears throat> in 2011, I was working um, in the street narcotics enforcement unit. We received a call for a, an assault in progress. 
And when we got there, we um, witnessed a man assaulting a woman uh, on the third story balcony of a private apartment building. Uh, he was punching her several times and it appeared he was trying to grab her legs and throw her over the balcony. I had drawn my firearm, I was ordering him to stop the assault, at which time he turned to me and, and stated that he was going to kill her. Uh, at that time I saw that in his hand that he, I believed he was punching her with, he had a very large knife and I quickly calculated that those punches were all stab wounds, stabs, he was stabbing her repeatedly. And I could see she was bleeding profusely. So I fired my weapon twice, striking him twice. And uh, he stabbed her again, I shot him a third time. Unfortunately, she had succumbed to her wounds and did not make it. Eventually, he was taken into custody. He actually uh, survived. What happened to you after the shooting? It was a, deemed a good shooting. I was justified. Uh, my gun wasn't removed or anything like that. Um, but the city sees you as a liability at that point. And I'm very fortunate that the timing of my shooting, there was no racially motivated shootings around that time that were deemed that way by the media or, or anything. If my incident was to happen today, it'd be one of the first things that uh, the news outlets post, the race and nationality of myself and or the, the other parties involved. Do you feel people respect the police here in the Bronx? Today's day and age, absolutely not, no. Why not? What's the problem? When I got on, I felt like the police were respected more. When there was a bunch of people at three o'clock in the morning hanging out on a street corner, uh, we would roll up with a police car, flick the lights on, and everybody would disperse. Today, they take that opportunity to uh, challenge us. And when the stop, question, and frisk went away, we had a lot of people deliberately like reaching in their waistbands just to see what kind of reaction they would get from the police. Commonly, illegal weapons and guns and stuff are carried in people's waistbands or uh, sweatshirt pockets. I wanted to know how New Yorkers felt about the NYPD and the officers who put their lives on the line to protect the public. I took to the streets around Times Square to ask both tourists and locals whether they felt safe in the Big Apple. Do you think crime has risen in the last few years? Crime? Definitely, I'm kind of scared to go on the subway sometimes. I'm afraid I'm gonna get like pushed or something. What Especially about defund the police? Defund the police? No, I agree with that. I agree with that, I say f the police. I see a lot more cops on the street. I see a lot more people like um, supporting each other. So yes, I do feel safe in New York. Yes, I do feel safe in New York. What do you think about defund the police? I have a lot of police friends. So I feel like defunding them isn't the, isn't the answer. I think it, we need to support them more personally. Do you feel safe in New York City? Kind of. I don't live here, but honestly, there are too many news about gangs and crimes there. So it's kind of like, it's not safe for me. Like this morning we were talking about that and I was like, let me go back home. <laughs> I don't want to be here. As we were walking down a street near Times Square, I approached a group of young men asking if they wished to be interviewed. Unfortunately, we did not capture this on camera. However, we did record the audio of one of them violently threatening myself and my cameraman demanding our equipment. We were lucky enough to walk hurriedly to a more populated area, ignoring the man's threats. However, the incident was a timely reminder of how nowhere is 100% safe in the streets of New York. So do you guys feel safe in New York City? Sometimes, not at night, not alone, not on the subway. And have you experienced crime here? Yeah, I've, so a couple things have happened to me. So I was like walking like to the grocery store literally the day I moved here and like a random man on a bike like punched me in the face and like biked away. 
and I was like bleeding everywhere. It was like pretty crazy. And then I also got ran over by a car, like a car like ran over my foot. I moved here like a month ago too. So it's like, yeah, it's like New York is like definitely tough. I've experienced that being a young woman in the city is very dangerous as well. I remember like my first time visiting New York, I was like, walking around at night and I got like street assaulted and harassed like this guy like came up behind me he like poked my ass and he was like he was like hey like like just screaming like kind of vulgar things at me and I was like I didn't know what to do in that moment I remember one time I was going to college and just because someone was having a bad day I bumped into them and had like really dark glasses I didn't even know her and she <laughs> me up no lie she uh, had a Snapple bottle and she pushed down my face and I deadass was going to school. Oh. At the end of the day, everybody got a weapon on them here. You have to have a weapon on you. Like, if you want to be safe, unfortunately, you have to have a weapon on you in New York. Are you guys armed now? Excuse me? Are you armed now? Have you got a weapon now? <laughs> no, you don't want to say it. That's fair. <laughs> like, like, I need to get pepper spray. I'm sorry. This is being filmed. I kind of tried to file a police report, but then I was like, they're not going to do anything. They've never done anything. Like, I think it's more important to direct that funding towards, like, mental health. W wouldn't you guys prefer more police people to protect you, I mean, against assault and stuff like that? I, I mean, if like, they actually no, did. I protect myself more than they could protect me. It's like, this shit's still gonna be the same. I'm still the one defending myself. I have to wait for you to come. I wondered whether the visceral hatred from some members of the public towards the police was having an impact on the morale of NYPD officers. To find out, I visited the police in college John Jay, where I met up with a retired NYPD officer turned professor. I entered the New York City Police Department in 1992 and I retired in 2012. Looking at the recent spike in violent crime, particularly in cities like New York, how much can we blame the BLM riots for this and the death of George Floyd? We're not gonna blame the BLM riots per se, right? But the George Floyd incident, let's just take, let's talk, talk about that case. Derek Chauvin has done more to destroy policing in this country than I think in any single event in my life. And I've seen a couple of police incidents that were really terrible, but this one, you know, kind of like takes the cake. And it came at a time where the movement was to this anti-police environment rhetoric that we saw. And this was this their, their quote unquote, like time to seize control. And that's basically what they did. Why do you think so many officers in the NYPD are retiring early? Not only have you had a lot of these reforms, but you've had legislation go against them, right? There's, they want to remove qualified immunity or they move re remove qualified immunity, which would make it easier to personally sue a police officer where you could be held liable. Even if you are right, you could still be sued. And the second thing is we've had in New York State by the city council uh, pass what's called the diaphragm law, which is basically if you try to arrest somebody and you make any effort to go around the neck, press on the chest, on the back, and you obstruct the breathing on somebody, the, we have district attorneys that are looking to arrest the cops for this, which has led to a lot of videos. You might have seen them online where you have five or six cops trying to figure out how they're going to tackle this guy because they're worried about where they put their hands, where they, where they grab them, and it, and it becomes a, a real problem. It's a big deal. And if you're a cop and you're worried about now not only getting arrested for doing your job, but now you're looking to get sued, and I could go to a, a county where it's better pay, better benefits, and nicer working conditions. Yeah, let's put it this way. If I, had, if I was working and I had the opportunity to leave and get a, a job somewhere else, I'd be out of here too. When we talk about statistics, it can turn some people off. It can be a bit dehumanizing. Can you paint me a picture of what it's been like in New York in the last few years to people who haven't been or, or have never been to New York? So in the last two and three quarters years in the subway system, I think we've had 24 homicides in the last two and three quarters years. From 2019, I think to 2002, we had 21. So almost 20 years, we only had 21 homicides. We've had 24 in the last two and three quarters. Is New York becoming a genuinely dangerous place to live? I don't think so, all right? Listen, I was, like I said, I was a cop in the 90s. It was dangerous back then. And a lot of people say, well, it's not as bad as it was in the 1990s. And I say, yes, you're right. But we shouldn't wait till it gets that bad in order to do something. So how bad was New York in the 1990s? And how did the city turn it around? Much of the answer lies with the former commissioner of the NYPD, Bill Bratton. Bratton was hired in the early 1990s by then mayor Rudy Giuliani to help fix the spree of homicides and violent crime plaguing the city. 
I sat down with Mr. Bratton over video link to discuss his time in the NYPD. Can you describe what New York was like before you joined the NYPD? On the streets, phenomenal amount of documented crime. In that year, 1990, my first year, there were 2,245 murders recorded in the city. Over one half million serious crimes reported in that city of seven and a half million people. There were 7,000 locations in the city of New York in the early 90s where drugs were openly being sold on street corners, parks. Prostitution was rampant in the uh, mid midtown Manhattan. In summary, it was a nightmare. Dante's Inferno might be a better description. What is the broken windows theory of policing? Broken windows is another term for disorder. Broken windows is effectively what we would call quality of life crime, oftentimes referred to as victimless crime, graffiti, uh, aggressive begging, things that where an individual is not actually assaulted, but in which they were put in fear, in which they were intimidated. I'm a strong proponent and supporter and implementer of broken windows policing. The idea that to effectively control crime, serious or minor, you can't just focus on just serious crime or you just can't focus on minor crime, broken windows. You have to have a series of initiative strategies, a comprehensive set of strategies that address both at the same time. Can you briefly explain what happened in New York to crime when you implemented your new broken windows policy? It declined dramatically, not only serious crime, but quality of life crime. Giuliani hired me as his first police commissioner. And the results in New York were dramatic. Uh, within my 27 months with him, uh, overall crime in the city went down by almost 40 percent. We got rid of the 7,000 open-air drug locations. We got rid of most of the prostitution. And what was the impact of that for the next 25 years, up until 2019? Crime continued to go down in the city of New York. Quality of life continued to improve in that the visibility of broken windows types of offenses declined so dramatically that tourism went up to 65 million a year by 2018. In 2018 was the safest year in the history of New York City as it relates to serious crime. There are fewer than 100,000 reported crimes 1990, if you remember, there were 500,000. There were, I think, about 270 murders versus the 2,243. But it all, fell, it all fell apart in 2019. Well, this is it. So it's interesting you say in 2019, things started to change. And you can explain your reasons why you think that happened. In the United States, we have a very serious political divide now in our country. We have forces on the far right. We have forces on the far left. Uh, on the left... The, Demo the Democratic side, Democratic Party largely, there is uh, what is called the progressive left woke criminal justice reform movement that really began to pick up steam in 2019, and uh, not just in my city and state, but throughout the country. A lot of that was being fueled by a conscious effort to elect district attorneys who believed that there had been too much mass incarceration, too much police enforcement, particularly involving minorities. To find out more about the impact of these left-wing district attorneys and why crime has surged in recent years, I spoke with Raphael Manguel from the Manhattan Institute, an organization that was pivotal in promoting the broken windows theory of policing. Well, in 2020, New York City saw a 46 plus percent increase in homicides, which is the single largest year over year increase in homicides in this city's history. Why do you think there's been a recent increase in crime in New York? I think it's been just a confluence of really bad policy decisions. We have seen incarceration rates drop significantly over the last decade plus. We have seen a multitude of reforms, all of which are aimed at lowering the transaction costs of committing crime and or raising the transaction costs of enforcing the law. So I'm thinking here of things like bail reform, uh, discovery reform, which you know creates all these new unfunded burdens that prosecutors have to comply with in order to bring a criminal case, raise the age legislation, which makes it you know almost impossible to hold a 16 or 17 year old uh, criminal defendant uh, responsible as an adult. Um, which means that they're almost never getting lengthy prison sentences. You have the Less Is More Act, which makes it much more difficult to send people back to prison for violating the terms of their parole. You have the progressive prosecutor movement where, you know, in Brooklyn and Manhattan, we now have uh, district attorneys who are explicitly committed to decarceration as an end in itself. 
there are of course many who support criminal justice reform in New York City. To get their point of view, I caught up with Tana Geneva, an independent journalist who focuses on crime. We met in a park overlooking New York's infamous jail, Rikers Island. Can you explain what Rikers Island is over there? What is Rikers Island? Uh, Rikers is a jail complex with 10 different jails. Um, it houses approximately um, 10,000 people and 85% of them are there pre-trial, so they're legally innocent. And it's just notorious for overcrowding and abuses and deaths. We've had 16 deaths just this year. So there is obviously this issue over what's called bail reform. Yes. So this is people wanting to not put people into Rikers, to not put people into jail before their trial begins. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is an issue where we, look, we, people do need to go to jail because they might be repeat offenders, they might have had a criminal record, and we need to make sure that people are safe, you know, the victims of crime are safe from these people at the same time as sort of having that balance. Uh, no, because um, people out on bail commit, re-offend re um, violently something like 2% of the time. It's extremely rare. Also, we're not talking about the elimination of all bail, we're talking about the elimination of cash jail, because if you have a lot of money, you can pay your bail and then go commit more violence. So the issue is that it's not, it's, it makes no sense in terms of the dangerous, dangerousness of the suspect just because they can't pay. Isn't it worth, even with that 2% of re-offending, to make sure to be on the safe side, as it were, with this bail reform? Um, no, because why don't we consider the public safety of people who are in jail pre-trial, AKA legally innocent? Like I mentioned, there were 16 deaths just this year. Why isn't there public safety an issue? So it's the balance, isn't it, between the, the safety of the public and the safety of the people who have been sort of uh, accused of crimes or awaiting right. trial? I, I don't want to sound like a crazy hippie, but people at Rikers are the public. People in prison are the public. Tanner isn't the only one who supports such reforms. Back in Manhattan, I met with an organization called Cop Watch whose sole purpose is to record the police and keep them accountable. So you've got this badge here, it says A cab. So it says all cats are beautiful. Yeah, well, all cops are- Is that are, really what it is? <laughs> yeah, well, they, all cops are bastards. You know, I, are they? Are they, are they really? My, well, I'm gonna be honest with you, not all, all right? There's some that are good, but they still have to listen to their bosses and they still have to commit the acts that their bosses tell them to do. How you doing there? Nice to meet you, Stephen. How are you doing? Nice to meet you, Steve. Yeah, I was like, Steve, Steve. So do you want to explain what, what we're doing here in the park? When we in the Washington Square Park, it's all about watching police. That's what we want to do. We want to make sure we can't get rid of them. I strictly want to abolish police, but that's not going to happen. So I want... So you, you actually want to abolish the police? Yeah, I, I don't even think, you know, I think they, they, they are the problem. And but who's going to Especially in, in black and brown communities. And in my neighborhood, we keep us safe. The people keep each other safe. Now, am yeah. I right in saying that you sued the NYPD? I sued and I won uh, $925,000. 925 wow. And what was that for, specifically? Uh, basically, because they tried to set me up. And I ended up um, audio recording for three hours all their activities within the, within the police station. It was recorded them admitting that I was nowhere near them to even harass me or arrest me. And they also were speaking about how they could buy guns and how they would love to buy a gun to plan on me. They was trying to find felonies to charge me with. Uh, I mean, they like that. Are we gonna go on a ride along or what's the plan? Do you yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, we're gonna go yeah. ride along. Okay. Can you explain what's going on in this radio? Oh yeah, yeah, right now um, there's calls going in. Uh, this is the NYPD dispatch radio. So if there's any emergency taking place, it will be related through the dispatch radio. At the same time they receive it, we receive it, and we're able to go to these calls. Do you think there are any good police officers? Oh no, there's a lot of good police officers. But can you be good in that uniform in the department? Nah. 
But it's undeniable that crime's gone up. I mean, so many people are victims of crime, and these people have got to go somewhere. They've got to go off the streets, right? Because they can be dangerous to pe just the ordinary members of the no, public. No, I mean, crime has, I mean, we ain't gonna lie about that. Crime has been a little bit crazy. We've been talking about it over the phone how these young kids are running up on old people and robbing them and stuff like that. Back in the days, you know, take it back in our days, we didn't play that. You came in my neighborhood and robbed old folks, we was going to find you. And believe me, once we did what we did, he wasn't robbing nobody else old in any neighborhood. But that's that's vigilante justice. Didn't no. That what can't you, be fair yeah, though, but can what it? you call police? Just because it got a badge? And well, they, they have the law, they have the legal system, they have to have, you know, proof of, they have to have evidence, they go to trial. Whereas you guys, you evidence. might... Well, let, they have evidence to lock me up. Well, there's, there's obviously problems, but the thing is, you can't rely on vigilante justice. I mean, yeah. you may get it, what happens if you got it wrong? What happens to the guy if people were lying or if you didn't have the right evidence? You may have caused... What some... did they have with him? What did they have with him what he got? You know what I'm saying? What did they have with my brother? Lies. You see, that's the thing that sometimes makes me, like, say, I guess people don't really understand what's going on. You know, if you stopped a lot of these white folks downtown, you're going to find a lot of them don't have guns. A lot of them have drugs. You know, we know <laughs> that a lot of them have drugs. Because in our younger days, we used to, you know, we used to do our thing to survive. Right? And, and believe me. So you were, you were dealing drugs to them? No, no better customers than the ones downtown. You know what I mean? Have you ever been a victim of, of crime? Have you ever been assaulted or robbed or anything like that? Yeah, I've been through it. <laughs> You've been through that? We've been initiated. We call it initiated, yeah. When we were young, I mean... You've been initiated, okay. When we were young, yeah, we've been beat. I mean, I've been jumped, I've been stabbed, I've been beat up. And what do you I've think should happen robbed. to the people who, who stabbed you and robbed you? I mean, they should go to prison, right? <laughs> nah, they, no, they was taken care of. They, they was taken care of. <laughs> they got taken care of, okay. I may sound like a bit of a wuss here, but I don't feel prepared to stab someone or to defend myself in that way. I haven't got a weapon, I've never been trained, I'm not used to... You know, so, do you know what I mean? So what about the people who, who don't feel able to protect themselves or defend themselves? Everyone should have the right to carry and defend themselves. We believe in the suck of the man now. <laughs> uh, everyone's, and, and, so I should everyone. have a gun to protect myself? It shouldn't, if I shouldn't that's, have... That's what it takes. Protect your life. If he puts his life in jeopardy by robbing you, that's on him. He's an adult. He makes a decision. You Listen, down, if everybody, I mean, I believe that. If everybody was strapped, <laughs> you to think about it twice. It's like the Western, you know what I mean? You challenge him. Be like, yo, listen. So it's better. three o'clock, we're going to do this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but so there was nobody getting robbed. I mean, it was. So I should have a gun instead of the police protecting me? Damn right, because. <sighs> What about, about what, what about women? What about children? I mean, what about people who are disabled? That's why you have the males there. In every in every family, we have our males, and that's know, another thing that happened. That you know, the power of the man, male power of protecting their women has been taken away. I mean, it's great the woman's independence and stuff like that. That's a beautiful thing, you know. But now, like I said, everything has a program behind it. So this independence causes a woman to feel like they don't need a man. With violent crime becoming a major issue for New Yorkers, I wanted to find out how it was impacting the campaign for governor in the upcoming midterm elections. Ryan Gudersky is a Republican activist who runs the 1776 Project and writes a substack analyzing political trends. How much influence is crime having in these midterms, do you think? It's huge. Crime is probably the third largest issue in America right now in some states, like in New York State, it's probably number one. You don't have to live in a high crime neighborhood to see crime every single day because it's on everyone's smartphone. Everyone's Instagram has, has probably videos of it or Twitter or Facebook, whatever social media you use. Those videos are shared constantly. So the anxiety over crime, even in rather low crime areas, is always prevalent. Let's talk about New York specifically. So obviously, as you mentioned, crime has risen a lot here in recent years. How much of an impact will that have on the midterms here in New York? It's everything. It's why this is why the governor's race is within single digits. I mean, Republicans haven't won a governor's race since 2002 with George Pataki. And even when they won, 
They never got 50%. I don't think Pataki ever got 50%, maybe one time, but he won three times. They are competitive. Lee Zeldin is competitive over the issue of crime. Can you give us a breakdown of that governor election in New York? Sure. So there's Governor Kathy Hochul, who is the, she was the lieutenant governor of the state with Andrew Cuomo was the governor. He had to step down for sexual assault allegations and she became the governor. She's never won an election as her own. She was a former one-term congressman from Western New York, from the Buffalo area. And there's Congressman Lee Zeldin, who's the Republican from Long Island. He has been in Congress for a couple of years, I would say six or eight, and he was a state senator before then, very popular on Long Island. And if a Republican traditionally can get a third of the vote of New York City, because upstate is so Republican, it will manage to win. Zeldin is polling close to a third in New York City, and that's why he's within single digits. It's on the razor's edge, and it's been moving in Zeldin's favor every single week that goes by. He was 20 points down, now he's within four or six points, depending on the poll you read. It could possibly see a Republican governor, which would be the biggest election in, in the country this year. It's not just in New York City that crime has risen. Many of America's major cities have been inflicted with surges of violence, homelessness, and rampant drug use. In these midterm elections, the Democrats will likely face an uphill struggle as voters make their verdict on the impact of radical district attorneys and activists who push slogans like defund the police. For New York, memories of the chaos of the 1990s are still in the past, for now.